find Matthew chapter 1 once again. And as you're finding it, I want to bring to your memory, at least for those of you who like older movies, or maybe you're old, so you've seen, you've just happened to seen them all, but Miracle on 34th Street is a Christmas classic. And it was released over 75 years ago in the summer, if you can imagine that. <laughs> Little Susan, played by Natalie Wood, is being taught by her mother not to believe in fairy tales. I think it's pretty clear from the script that her mother, a young divorcee, is trying to make sure that her daughter doesn't grow up with fantasies and illusions of how things ought to be that will just really end up leaving her brokenhearted in life. And for those of you who've seen it, you know how the story ends. There's all the mail that comes in authenticating Kris Kringle as the real Santa Claus and even a miracle, uh, a few miracles at the end as they get a house uh, for their family. But I wonder today how many adults teach their t children intentionally or by their lack of commitment to the Lord not to believe in Christmas. I don't mean Santa or the goodwill and kindness of Christmas. I mean Christmas itself. I mean Christmas himself. If we have just sentiment, just festivity, just feel good stuff, it really would serve the next generation if we would just go ahead and inoculate them with the world's vaccine of anti-supernaturalism. May I ask you, though, do you believe in Christmas? Read with me in Matthew chapter 1, again, verses 18 and following. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. The title of the message is simply, Do You Believe in Christmas? I read an article just, just a few years ago. They compared some statistics uh, from back in 2014 to about 2017 or 2018. And here's what Jeannie Ortega Law in the Christian Post Reporter said. Let me just read you a, a brief section. The number of Christians and religious nuns who believe in the virgin birth of Jesus Christ has decreased significantly since 2014, according to a survey released by the Pew Research Center. Went on to say, overall, 66% of Americans believe Jesus was born to a virgin, but that's down from 73% in 2014. And here's what I found particularly disturbing. As for millennials, less than half, 44%, now believe in all four events of the biblical nativity, the virgin birth, the angel announcement, the wise men's visit, and Jesus in a manger. This is a drop from 59% in 2014. Allow me this morning to give you the implications of that right there. The implications of not believing in the virgin birth of our Lord. When you deny the virgin birth, you deny the miracle of Christmas. Therefore, number one, you deny that Jesus is the God-man. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John told us that. 
And so let me just say it again. If you deny the virgin birth, you deny that Jesus is that God-man. Because if he was preexistent, and he was, and if he became flesh, and he most certainly did, he can only be God if his birth into this world was not caused by human means. He's the only begotten of God. He's God's only begotten son. The Greek word there means unique and one of a kind. There were other miraculous births, to be sure. But only this birth was unique. Only this birth was an immaculate conception. The wording in God's word here in Matthew chapter 1 It doesn't preclude Jesus from having an earthly mother, but it most certainly precludes Jesus from having an earthly father, at least biologically speaking. Why didn't Paul say in Galatians 4, 4, why didn't he say, and Joseph begat? You know, all through the Old Testament, it's the men that do all the begatting. Did you notice that? I mean, the women are seldom mentioned. Now, that's maybe another sermon for another day. But what did Paul say? He said, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. If you deny the virgin birth, you deny that he's the God-man. Secondly, if you deny the virgin birth, you deny that Jesus is sinless. And I've got a little parenthesis here. And you affirm that Mary is a lying fornicator. Okay? Let's just be real. Romans 5.12, just an incredible verse, just absolutely chalked with theology. Listen to it. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, there's the doctrine of original sin. There's the affirmation of a literal Adam and Eve in Genesis. And death through sin, there's the fall. And thus death spread to all men because all sinned. There's the affirmation that death spreads through men. Death spreads to all. None are immune. We're all, we all have this congenital defect, if you will. We are born with a sin nature, but not Jesus Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, and and Adam all die, but then he talks about the second Adam. Just as the first Adam was a representative head and hurt us, the second Adam, Christ, our representative, our Lamb of God that died for our sin, he was sinless. He was a perfect sacrifice. We will be honoring that here in just a few minutes as we observe the Lord's Supper with unleavened bread and unfermented grape juice. He was pure. In the same way, you have to erase the concern of Joseph, or at least the calm of Joseph, after the angelic announcement. You know what I mean? If you deny that Jesus is sinless, then you're also denying, well, why was Joseph concerned? Well, well, maybe he was concerned because he should have been concerned. Well, then why was he, why was he comforted? Why was he, he calm after the angelic announcement if there's no virgin birth? You see, you have to erase about the whole story without the virginal conception and birth of Jesus. Look back with me at Matthew chapter 1. Look down at verse 25. And he did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son, And he called his name Jesus. In Luke chapter 1, there's a word that is used. It's the same word as when Peter's shadow was sought, thinking that maybe there would be healing if Peter's shadow would fall on the people there in the book of Acts. But listen to Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 30. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great. He will be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom 
there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I do not know a man? He, she obviously was not saying, I just don't know anybody. But she was speaking about intimacy. And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the highest will, here's the word, overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. In other words, this is nothing sensual. This is the presence and power of God. This is not a man. This is the God of the universe his power entering the womb of Mary. If you deny the virgin birth, you deny that Jesus is the God-man. You deny that he is the sinless Son of God. And thirdly, you deny the Bible is true. Isaiah the prophet was quoted in our very text in Matthew chapter 1. Behold, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and bring forth a son. That's a sign. You know, some say, well, it's a young woman. But the Hebrew word is the same. There's a couple of words, the Alma and Bethulma. The Hebrew word there, though, uh, I don't know why liberals make such a big deal and they want to trans... Well, I do know because they don't want to believe in the virgin birth. But it's the same word as in Genesis 24, 43, where you have... Um, this beautiful love story of Isaac and Rebecca. Behold, I stand by the well of water, and it shall come to pass that when the Alma, the virgin, comes out to draw water, and I say to her, please give, please give me a, a little water from your pitcher to drink. And then, of course, the word is used in Song of Solomon about the virgin in, in, in chapter 1, verse 3. And Besides that, the word virgin here in the Greek, the New Testament was written in Greek, the Old Testament Hebrew, it's parthenos. It always means a chaste young woman, a virtuous, a virgin woman, a woman who has not known a man. If you deny the virgin birth, you deny the truthfulness of of Scripture. You deny the sinlessness of Jesus, and you deny that He is the God man. But here's the last one. You deny yourself a Savior who is Christ the Lord. You see, if his identity is in question, if his sinlessness is in question, you don't have anyone who has the power to save you. His death is maybe a historical fact, but spiritually it's an inconsequential fact. Carl F.H. Henry, the dean of evangelical theologians, brilliant man, argues that the virgin birth, and I quote, is the quote, essential historical indication of the incarnation bearing not only an analogy to the divine and human natures of the incarnate, meaning Jesus was totally human in his nature and totally divine in his nature at the same time, but also bringing out the nature, purpose, and bearing of this work of God to salvation. This theologian is saying the virgin birth is absolutely integral to Jesus' saving work on the cross. Someone has given me a poem uh, Judy Barber, her brother, wrote this poem. I thought it was good. He, this is a poem really from a, a new convert in Christ. He wrote it just a couple of years or less after he was saved. And there was a great change in his life, but it's called God's Indescribable Gift. It came to pass on a stable floor, the Lord of all was born. As wise men came to offer praise, King Herod offered scorn. The shepherds now beheld the child in swatting clothes he lay. No purple robe for this new king, he slept in manger's hay. For unto us a child is born, no trumpets heralded his birth, but one bright star proclaimed God's gift, good will, peace on earth. Frankincense and myrrh were brought, and gold at his feet were laid, but in all their worth could not compare to the life he later gave. For unto you a Savior is born, he came to seek to save, born of God and born of woman in his life, for you he gave 
Thank you, Jesus, you do for us what we can never do. You wash away the stain of sin by faith. We trust in you. If you deny the virgin birth, you deny that he is the God-man. You deny that he is sinless. You deny the truthfulness of the Bible. And you deny yourself a Savior. So how should we respond? Well, do you believe in Christmas? A belief in Christmas makes no sense if you don't commit your life to Jesus Christ. Just believing intellectually a fact, believing, yeah, I believe he was really born of a virgin. That doesn't save you. Now, if you deny the virgin birth, I don't see how you can be saved. But just affirming the virgin birth does not check the list uh, off and say, oh, well, you believe in the virgin birth, you can come to heaven. No, it makes no sense for you to believe in it, though, and not say, my Lord and my God, I give you my life. A belief in Christmas means you recognize your need for the intervention of God in this cold, cruel world. You see, God intervened. God interposed himself. God became a man. He became flesh at just the right time, which means you need a relationship with God. A belief in Christmas should mean that you recognize your need for the sinless Savior's sacrifice in your place. Do you recognize your need? Have you been saved? I mean, have you truly given your life to Jesus Christ in repentance and faith, saying, Lord, I am, as Caitlin said, I am not faithful. I, I have messed up. I, I am not who I ought to be. But Lord, you You are my righteousness. I give you my life. I trust what you did on the cross to save me. Has that happened in your life? A belief in Christmas should mean that you have a sobering reverence for what that baby was born to do. Die on the old rugged cross. 